1921 to 1923, he was president. He's not known for a lot, but there's one thing that he did that he's well, uh, really known for, and people followed it. He got an Airedale Terrier. Nobody even knew what an Airedale Terrier was at that time, but he got one. And you know what became the most um, prevalent dog in America during that period? Airedale Terriers. Why? Because people will follow leaders. When Jackie Kennedy was first lady of of the United States, the clothes she wore and the hairstyle she had became the prevalent style of the day. Why? Because people will follow leaders. That's what people do. But when the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase. Even those that are not appointed or voted as a leader have influence over others. Uh, This is not, I'm not saying anything specific about this. This is just an example. Why do people today wear jeans with holes in them? Why do they do that? When I was a kid, if you had a pair of jeans, oh my, I'm not going outside with those jeans on. But why is it like that today? Because of what? (laughs) Because it's the style that has been pushed and people follow others. Why have we gone from a country that in the early 60s, Andy Griffith was the number one show in America to, and I don't know that this is the number one show in America, but it's a very prominent show, to The Walking Dead. Why is that? Because when the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase. Why have we gone from the number one song in America in the 1940s was Glenn Miller's Chattanooga Choo Choo? I don't, I've heard it before, but it's it's just a little fun little song. Number one song in America in 1940. To today, the prominent songs that we hear, and I I looked up one person, I can't tell you a song that she sings, Cardi B. Don't know anything about any of the songs that she sings, but it's not the Chattanooga Choo Choo. (laughs) Guarantee you that. Why is that? Because when the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase. You know, we're we're in a society where the temperature has been turned up a little bit at a time over the years and over the decades, and it's got hotter and hotter and hotter, and now we're in a boiling kettle. Because when the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase, and we don't even know it. We don't even know it. As the wicked increase in numbers, in ages, in power, and in riches, then sin and depravity increase too. Hence, the society that we have today. When the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase. Look at the second half of that verse. But the righteous shall see their fall. Their fall? Their fall, yes, it means this too. Their fall from the place of authority and power. Their fall from the place of honor and riches and grandeur. It includes that, but it includes something more than that. It it, Uh, doesn't necessarily mean their fall from the top of the authority to a lower rung of society. It means that at times, but it doesn't only mean that. It means that their, their their transgressions will pick up speed and they'll fall at an exponential rate and it will go faster and faster. And it means also that the righteous 
will see it. We'll see it happening. We'll notice that it's happening. We'll see the, the spiral, the downward spiral that is happening in this world. Yes, it means they'll fall off their pedestal at times, but it also means that you and I, when we see the, the sudden and quick decline and depravity that's happening, we will notice that and we will see it. But the righteous shall see their fall. We'll see the wicked dive into a lower and more despicable condition. And we're seeing that in the United States of America today, where we are becoming a despicable society. Today, we can see that decline accelerating in our country. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought five years ago that we would have people walking around that are, are proud and boastful of their transsexuality. I would not have thought that was even possible. We are seeing a sudden and precipitous decline by the wicked in this society. Have you ever wondered, can't they see where this is heading? Don't you see where society is going? They don't, folks. They don't see that. But the righteous shall see their fall. Yet, they can't see it, and they have pleasure as they dive deeper into their fall. They don't even realize the hole that they are in. They don't realize the hole that society has created, the, the hole that is created by homosexuality, and the hole that is created by transsexuality, and the hole that is created by drugs, and the hole that is created by civil disobedience. They don't even see it happening. They do not even see it happening. But the righteous, the Bible says, but the righteous shall see their fall. We see that fall that is happening. They don't see the whole of one worldism that is going on in this world. They do not see it, but we are witnessing that fall. I hope that you see what is happening. You know, I, I, I was just, um, I have sort of an inquisitive mind, and I know what the word fall means. I know what it means, but I wanted to look it up just to get a very uh, academic uh, view of the term fall, and I, I found it very interesting. The, it means literally this, a move downward, typically rapid and freely, without control, from a higher to a low, lower level. Is our society in a fall? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. The wicked are falling away from the glory of God. They're falling away from his wisdom. They're falling away from his justice and his truth and and faithfulness. Um, Psalms 58.10 says this, the righteous shall rejoice. Not like, yes, look, they're falling, yeah. Not like that. But the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. The vengeance is the decline. And you know why I can rejoice? Because I know that God is in control. Society seems out of control. And it, who knows the end of where this all ends up at. But I can rejoice because I know God Almighty is still in control. And what he said is coming to pass. And I hope you understand and can see what I'm saying there. Verse number 17. Correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. I, I, I find it really interesting. In, in verse 15, talking about the rod and reproof. And then verse, verse 16 talks about how wickedness is multiplying. I think it's because the rod and reproof were not used. And then back in the 17, he says, Now, correct thy son. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give the light unto thy soul. Correct thy son. Do you want ease of mind in life? When you're my age, correct your son. Do you want satisfaction and contentment in your relationship with your son? 
Correct your son. Correct means to set on the right path. And it's not a singular spanking is not correcting. Not a singular spanking. You know, we all, we all did correcting this morning. Do you realize that? Every one of us did correct. Well, who drove your car? Okay. Spencer did correcting this morning. <clears throat> I, uh, I intentionally, in my Tesla, put it on autopilot to drive this morning. Um, and you know what? The autopilot would do this. And every one of us, as we drove a car this morning, we were correcting. We And it wasn't corrected. I wasn't correct until I pulled into that parking place up there. Then I could say, I cor correct the car because I was correcting. Now I'm corrected the, uh, the drive in. I know I'm not making a lot of sense there, but it is the truth of the matter is this. One discipline of your son is not you having corrected your son. It is a continual, continual, continual process until you are completed. Verse 17, correct thy son. It's a continuing, a continual correcting. And he shall give thee rest. He shall give thee rest, and he, ye, ye shall, uh, he shall give delight into thy soul. We all want a son that will tenderly love us. Your parents want you to love them. Your parents want to be proud of you. Your parents want you to act with prudent behavior. I, uh, <clears throat> we, were, we had our granddaughter at our house yesterday, uh, Friday, Friday, and I noticed a little attitude in her. She's taking after her grandmother. It's, but notice a little attitude in her. And Linda sat her down and says, I don't like you answering like that when I speak to you. A little while ago, you said something to your grandfather, and it was wrong how you said it. I love this about her. The tears started pouring down her eyes because she didn't want to hurt her abuela and her grandfather. We should want that tenderness in our children. And it's only going to happen with the right type of continual correcting, of correcting them until you park the car and it's done. Don't give up. I, um, some of us have older children. Mine are all, my youngest is 32. I know uh, Brother Brown has older children. The Mrs. Brown, she was a, just a child when they had children, but, but not Brother Brown. We have older children. I think it's still the parents. We have to be careful at our age and their age of life. But I think it's still right and appropriate to give wise insight to life. We have to change how we correct a little bit. But I think we still, they still need that from us. I want my children, more than anything, to fear God. To have a, a tenderness to God Almighty. And I'm going to move to the next verse. I think you'll get the point. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law... Happy is he. You know, I've heard for decades, and maybe you have too, that where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I've heard for decades that it really is about you need a goal in life. You need to be shooting for something in life. You need a vision for where you're headed. Vision 2020, I think, was the big thing for churches all over the, all over the country. Um, <clears throat> that you, need, you need a vision for what you're going to do and accomplish for God in life. You need to know where you're headed. This is an interpretation. Personally, I don't believe that's the primary 
interpretation of that. I think the truest sense of that is this, where there is no prophecy, the people perish. Often the word used for vision in the Old Testament has to do with prophesying or preaching. The vision of Isaiah is a phrase that we see in the book of Isaiah. And it was really talking about the preaching of Isaiah. In the New Testament, we see that prophesying and preaching are mentioned in the place of a vision. I think that the need of you and I, the need of America, is to hear the preaching of the Word of God, period. Without a vision, without a preaching, the people perish. You know, and look, look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Verse number 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Well, what did it mean when it says it's precious? It's precious, but it's also, there wasn't a lot of it. There was no open vision. In the latter end of Eli's life, there wasn't a lot of preaching, and the society felt it. It had become a wicked, wicked place. Where there is no vision, the people perish. In the time of Asa, and I think every time I read that, I think of y'all's child. In the time of Asa, um, and look at 2 Chronicles 15. 2 Chronicles 15. And verse number 3. Now for a long season, Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. I'm trying to show you that the vision is not something that you and I set as a goal to attain to, like we often hear. Without a vision, the people will uh, without no, without, uh, when there is no vision, the people will perish. What is happening in any era of history when the Word of God has not been preached, people perish. Societies perish and societies fall. I can look at many other passages that we have and I won't do that. I think today, now is the case with the Jewish people. The, the Jewish people have perished for a millennia because there was no vision. There was no preaching of the gospel that they were listening to. I think before the, the apostles went to the Gentiles, up until that time, the Gentiles were a perishing people because there was no Vision. I think you think about all the popish countries today. We live in a, in a technologically wonderful place, but you think about all the popish countries in this world today. You look at South America, where people live in abject poverty, where there are issues in those countries. It's because they aren't allowed to hear the preaching of the Word of God. They can't read the Word of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish, and we see that happening all the time. Uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, so that here the people are perishing for lack of knowledge. I believe that's the case. The second half of that verse, and we'll be done, says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. How do I know that we're talking about the Bible, uh, uh, the Word of God here? The first half says, where there is no vision, the people perish, and immediately he goes into, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I think that if you and I want to be happy people, first and foremost, this is what we need. If we want our society to change, 
This is what our society needs. If we want to impact our kids and use the rod and reproof correctly, this is what they need. We need the Word of God in order to be happy people. Let's have a vision. Let's have a vision for right. Let's have a vision so that the people we love don't perish. We're dismissed.